A quick history lesson. Unix was born at Bell Labs, a division of Bell Telephone, which was the telephone company up until it was broken up in the 1980s. The largest remnant of Bell Telephone today is AT&T. It was the early 1970s, and many computers were changing the scene. Mainframes had been around for a while, and people understood how to use them. You wrote your program and data, and you put it on punch cards. You handed them to the nice operator, who put them on a tape. And when your time slot on the computer came up, they loaded your tape, ran your program, spun the output off onto another tape, and the nice operator printed your results from that second tape. Minis, though, were different. They were smaller, for one thing. Instead of taking up the whole room, they only took up a wall or so, like a row of file cabinets. They were cheaper, too. You could get a mini for less than a million dollars. And they were also more interactive. A user could sit down at a terminal, which was a printer or a screen and a keyboard, and communicate directly with the mini computer. It was obvious from the start that a mini computer had to host multiple users at the same time. Mini computers were where the computer revolution really took its cause to the masses. Unix was born to do this. It was born to share expensive resources with large numbers of users. It was born to do, or appear to do, multiple jobs at the same time, a process called multitasking. It was born with security to keep my files separate from your files and my memory separate from your memory. In 1974, Unix went to college, where it landed in the computer science department at the University of California, Berkeley. When it emerged in 1978, it was different. There were more utilities different editors, an entirely new kernel, Berkeley sockets, and perhaps most importantly, a better implementation of TCP IP, the backbone protocol of the internet. That same time frame saw the explosive growth of ARPANET into the internet of today, and then came the web. When Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web, long about 1989, he ran the first server on a Next workstation running NextStep, which is not only a Unix-like operating system, but formed the basis for Mac OS X and iOS when Apple bought Next and rehired Steve Jobs in 1996. You may know the rest of this story. In the 1980s, Richard Stallman and GNU made a name for themselves by writing replacements for most of the Unix user space, from the C compiler to the shells to the tiniest utilities like LS. But even today, in 2015, their kernel still isn't finished. The bottom line is that in 1991 or so, when 32-bit 8386 computers showed up, with the power and memory of many computers that came before them, Linus Torvalds wrote a Unix-like kernel and gave it to the internet for free. When that kernel was combined with a GNU user space, Linux was born. So why does this ancient history still matter? The concept of user space, kernel space, super users, and root all make a lot more sense when you picture 20 or 30 of us using the machine at the same time, only one of whom is authorized and competent to maintain the system. More importantly, the software tools, security concepts, and most of the system's control files are still the same, or at least called the same thing. It's important because Linux and Unix-like operating systems can be obtuse. It helps to know that gawk, which is a file utility, is the GNU equivalent of awk, and that the word awk has nothing whatever to do with what the program does. It stands for the initials of Aho, Weinberger, and Kernigan, who wrote it. Likewise, Biff, the original program that told you you have mail which can still be installed in modern Linux, was named after a dog at Berkeley who barked at the mailman. As a Unix-like operating system, Linux inherited all of this history. It hasn't clung to anything that's not useful anymore, but the concept behind its virtual memory system goes back to those days of $50,000 a meg. The commands are still the way they are because they made sense on an ADM3A terminal. In other operating systems, out-of-date memes like these would be signs that the OS is past its prime. For Linux, they're its strength. They're the consistency that allows it to move forward without abandoning software. You'll trip over this historical rubble from time to time. It's inevitable. But these mechanisms are well understood and well tested. Welcome to Linux.